And I'm here at Tubbercurry Community Library in Sligo for the second of our Different Ireland's Debates with a panel of politicians and an audience will be discussing the issues facing rural Ireland and whether the recovery has been felt outside the cities. Thanks, Miriam, and welcome to Tubbercurry Community Library, where we're holding the second of our Different Ireland debates. Tonight, we're focusing on the experience of rural Ireland, not just here in Sligo, but throughout the country. You've just been hearing about crime in the capital, but of course, crime is a big concern in rural areas as well, along with other issues, including transport, emigration, jobs, flooding, and of course, the much vaunted economic recovery. We'll be discussing those issues in a few moments with our panel and with our audience. But first, here's Rita O'Reilly. rainy weekend in Roscommon, but the passengers on this rural charter from Banagher County Offaly don't care. They're a hen party up for fun in Lock Key Forest and Activity Park. <laughs> Financed from state and EU funds, it's a massive attraction in the area. Later, more stags and hens are ready to party in Leitrim's Carrig on Shannon. It's the destination in Ireland and it's come the hotspot for a good reason, you know. The location is the key factor. It's very close to Dublin, very close to the north. It is the gateway into the northwest. The hens and stags fill Philip Coughlin's apartments in the winter months and up at the canal in Battle Bridge on the Shannon Blue Way tourist trail, they've given a lift to more small business ventures. Stags and hens are, are hugely important to us here. During the winter time when there isn't as much activity, there's a lot of small businesses here trying to make a good living out of this. Uh, and uh, we, we need help here. Money is the issue. The funding is not being made available. Some of these small startups have got government or EU funding. But when it comes to big infrastructure, rural Ireland feels it's kept waiting. Despite positive state interventions, people here say tourism alone won't fix the future. And despite the lifestyle payoffs to living in rural areas, they say rural Ireland is just not prioritised. A common theme here is that once you cross the Shannon, you're into a different Ireland, where the state has withdrawn services, where there's a lack of investment, where Leitrim and rural Ireland have been left behind. Many of its people, too, still leaving it. Migration and emigration once again. Well, we buy a hundred Joes. So we rear them for lambs, you know. We sell their lambs. Everybody is kind of more or less holding on to their farming and relying on other incomes. I think that's happening everywhere, you know. Sheep prices are not high enough for the farm to be sustainable. Eddie's second income is from building and carpentry, but reliably paid work is not here. I suppose I'd have been in London probably five years ago when everybody left, you know. But um, we, my father got uh, Alzheimer's, so... Um, Myself and my wife, we looked at we looked after Daddy for the last four years of his life, you know, and that that, that you know we, that that just led us into poverty, like you know. Eddie Mitchell is the founding chair of the Love Leitrim campaign set up when fracking was the biggest inward investment being talked about. The vision is to allow people to live here safely, first of all, and to develop our industries. We want to see farming continued and developed. We, we love this place, like, and people don't come here um, for the rain, you know. But they, they, they stay here because they love the place, like. The Love Leitrim chair, though, has had to love it and leave it. He's had to take the flight to London for work. The hard part is leaving, you know. The hard part is, 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 is being away from the kids, like, you know. It's back to the future for Eddie and thousands like him but he hasn't given up. We need an economy, we need our banks lending. You know, we need to be able to, to get on with borrowing money and, and spending money and, 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 and getting on with our lives. I do see a future. I'm continuing to price work here. I'm being asked about work. The question now is, can that work pay or does it make more sense to be away? 
Ireland is a two-tiered country at this moment in time. Over in Tubber Curry in Sligo, Conor Fitzgerald of the Family Resource Centre is hosting a Friday get-together. Helen Rochford Brennan is ambitious for her area. Rather than talking small about this area, we need to talk big, but we need infrastructure. We did lose nearly 250 jobs in the area and that's had a huge impact because like every job lost here in Tubbercurry could be 10 jobs lost in Dublin. It's the equivalent mm. to that. The sense they have of state services withdrawing from rural Ireland was heightened with the decision to close 95 Garda stations in 2013, most of them in rural areas. In Sligo Leitrim constituency alone, 10 closed. We are the second largest town in the county outside Sligo Town and we have a part-time Garda station. If there's one Garda assigned to that station, if a call comes in, he has to ring Ballymore to get help out. When he goes off duty, there's nobody to take his place. It's uh, down to the Ballymore area again. Over in Colani, southwest of Sligo, Katrina McGoldrick sees herself as one of the lucky ones. She had surgery in Sligo General Hospital before news that the service would be delivered from Galway. Well, in the last election, what we were looking for was the return of breast cancer services to Sligo Regional Hospital. I don't think the political will was there, even though after Fianna Fáil removed it, Fianna Gael promised us they would return it. That never happened and it's not going to happen now. Unfortunately, five of my good friends are, aren't here. Some of those people that are in those photographs aren't here anymore. And I feel very let down and very let down on their behalf. The current locations for centres of excellence are credited with vastly improved outcomes for cancer patients. But to get to one, patients with breast, prostate or other cancers must bus from as far as the top of Donegal to hospital in Galway. Many rely on charity to get them there and for lodging if they stay. They stopped at Galway. There's a Galway-Dublin line and there's nothing above that for the people. Back in Tubber Curry, poor broadband provision is a hot topic, as it still is in many parts of rural Ireland. We need stronger, faster broadband, a higher speed to attract the businesses and the, the, the larger companies into our area. We have fabulous facilities here. It's a wonderful area to live. I'm one of the people that return to live here. But we need to start speaking up and looking for these services to be here on our doorstep. For some, the recent floods are a major election issue. But on the road to El Finn, the receding waters are not Catherine Ryan's concern. I'm canvassing for the elderly. I am one of those people. You alright? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want your drink of water? No, good, yeah. Take a drink of water. Seven and a half years ago, John had a major stroke and he was in the full of his health at the time. I'm his full-time carer, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And only for the nurse-led day hospital in St. Patrick's, I wouldn't have been able to look after him. I just cannot say how good it was, but it's gone now. Catherine too has health issues, but she can no longer rely on the daily presence of a nurse or doctor at the daycare centre attached to St. Patrick's Hospital in Carrie on Shannon. I'd moved from being a five-day nurse-led centre to a three-day social centre, and there's a huge difference. I can't leave John at any time. It means I can't go out unless I bring him, and it's a big ordeal to get him ready. John gets around eight weeks respite care in the hospital. And there's good news. In the last fortnight, it got the go-ahead for a new build. We've, uh, I suppose, fought long and hard. A uh, very exciting uh, minister has announced uh, capital investment of uh, well over 15 million towards the, the building of a new 90-bed, purpose-built uh, community nursing unit. There's a new 16 million hospital announced for Carrick, mm -hmm. but they still haven't got any news of the Nurse Lake Day Centre. Mm -hmm. People are assessed by a nurse if there's a requirement. That is if there's a referral by a GP or a referral by a public health nurse. If those referrals grow, I have to say grow, I'm not even going to say to continue to grow, but if those referrals grow, then an investment of that nature will be provided for the day hospital. Over generations, rural election issues have hardly changed. But for candidates, the traditional predictable outcomes may not hold true this time. Rita O'Reilly reporting. I'm joined now uh, here in 
Uh, Tupper Curry by Damien English, Fine Gael's uh, Minister, Junior Minister at the Department of Jobs, by Eamon O'Creeve, Fianna Fáil's spokesperson on Agriculture, Independent, Michael Fitzmaurice and Malcolm Noonan of the Green Party, the party's environment, community and local government uh, uh, spokesperson. Damien English, Fine Gael's mantra in this election is keep the recovery growing, going. It's um, very hollow sounding to a lot of people that we saw in that report. I suppose the message is, if we're keeping the recovery going, we'll generate the finances of new job creation to finance all the improvements and services that are needed. And eventually it'll trickle down to people in rural Ireland? No, I think, I think it is moving out quite a lot. I mean, we are even seeing announcements there in that, in that of, of a new nursing home being built at 90 Bed. Uh, job creation is moving out to all the areas. What we're trying to do is, through our regional action plan for jobs, is to, is to make sure the recovery is pushed out. And sustainable jobs will give you the finances you need in all our regions to deliver the services and to build them back up in some cases, but in some cases to put in new services, new initiatives. Yeah. But it's about... And I, I, I it all sounds great, with, with respect, Mr. It all sounds <coughs> great, but a lot of people that we saw in that film simply haven't felt the recovery. And what's more, they have lost the hope that they ever will. Yeah, well, I would say the difference in the last, what I noticed on the doors and compared to the last five years is that hope is back in most places. And I think most people sense that there is a recovery in the country. Uh, the job now of the next government, and we believe that we're the best place to do that based on credibility over the last five years, is to make sure that recovery does deliver for all areas and into, into all regions. It, it, it does take a bit of time for a recovery that is based on a jobs recovery then to give you the finances you need to invest in services. A key example will be this year now we're able to invest an extra 900 million into the health services that wasn't there last year. That's because of the recovery, because there's more jobs okay. and there's a link there. Okay. And that, that's exactly what we have to continue. The more jobs gives you the more finances you have to pay for more services. Okay, we'll come back to health in a moment. Uh, Eamon O'Keeve, uh, a lot of people in Rita's report and, and that you hear talking about their main complaint is that the state is withdrawing from rural Ireland. But that's a process that has been going on for decades. Well, not necessarily. And it's, I think, very appropriate that we're here in Tubba Curry this evening because we relocated the Department of Community, Rural and Wealth Affairs to this very town. We had 110 jobs, civil service jobs, in this town. The town itself was doing very well as a consequence. Five years later, all of those jobs are gone. The Department of Rural Affairs is gone. That has been the attitude of this government. As well as that, you saw, for example, targeted cuts on rural guardy, on rural schools, on relocation to community welfare officers that used to live in the community yeah. and used to know the community and could make very informed decisions but, but because they actually knew the people, yeah. they moved them all into the big town okay. to make people travel 50 miles for the service. But with respect, you were Minister for Community and Rural, uh, rural and Guild Act Affairs for quite a, a length, lengthy time during the period of the last government. During the last five years of the Fianna Fáil government, there were more than 200 post office closed, for instance. There's only 20 closed in the lifetime of this government. Yes, because there were a lot of unviable post offices. You haven't seen this government reverse that and open those post offices. Uh, therefore, they must agree... But if you were there as Minister for Rural Affairs, uh, surely you must have had a problem <coughs> well, with that. To be quite honest, we created, of course, 5,000 decentralised jobs uh, around the country. Uh, and that is, they are very, very sustainable jobs into the future. And one of the interesting things about this campaign is just how the world is changing. The biggest demand I'm getting on the ground in the houses is that we want fibre rollout in every house, in every business in rural okay. Ireland. Now that has huge advantages in terms of jobs because if you have the fibre in every house, lots of people have to travel long distances to work, could actually okay. work from well, we, home. We might, we might pick that up with our audience a little bit. Michael Fitzmaurice, um, given the scale of the economic meltdown that this country suffered, it only stands to reason that services suffered. They serve, suffered in rural Ireland, they suffered in urban Ireland, and yet we have seen signs of recovery, extra money to spend on services. That's the result of the government. It's not the result of people like yourself uh, well, criticising them. First of all, um, uh, services in certain parts of the country didn't suffer. The west of Ireland has been really affected. Eddie there in the clip that we have seen, I can see where he's coming from. Um, as a farmer, he was explaining that he couldn't live on the farm. And the reason he cannot is because of, of a bad cap policy that has been delivered to the West of Ireland farmers. The other thing, and I, and I noted, he said he was trying to price work, but he couldn't get any. The, in the last few years, we are gone to a system where we want big guys pricing all the work. At the moment, and I have smaller contractors coming mm. into me, um, in Irish water, when you're pricing it, you have to have a certain turnover. A small guy, with small turnover, cannot price the work. 
And unless there, there is five pillars to make sure we revive rural Ireland. There is the likes of, okay. you give a fair cap policy. You make sure, as Eamon said, that the likes of broadband. We need banking sector. Mm. We need the facilities. And But one thing I'll make it very clear. Okay. The people in all parts of rural Ireland are well capable of taking the baton if the environment okay. is created yeah. for them. Okay, that they but are you, given have to, you have chance. to accept, you have to accept that you can't have every service that you'd like at every crossroad of but rural But the thing Ireland. about it is, a lot of the services, if they were done properly, I believe myself in health, that there may be enough of money going in. You cannot keep throwing money into something. Something is wrong if the service isn't getting better. Okay. So somebody at the captain of the ship has to make the calls. Okay, let me you bring have in, to make a difference. Let me bring in Malcolm Noonan. Malcolm Noonan, every time there is a plan for investment or infrastructure or a new industry in, our, in rural Ireland, a lot of people would say, you see the Greens complaining about it, criticising and giving out. I don't think that's the case. I think um, what your footage really showed was that there's a, an, a large amount of really courageous people who have fought through the recession and now we're being told we're out the other side and that things are improving and they're not seeing it. And there's no doubt, but there's some of the, 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 uh, the um, projects that were featured there were, would have come under the leader rural development programme and mm. that programme has been subsumed now um, under local government by, particularly by Phil Hogan and followed up by Alan Kelly and is, ha is having a detrimental effect on rural communities because of the fact that it was uh, taken a, a best model practice in Europe that had been delivered extremely well in Leader 1 and Leader 2 and now is going politicised in my view. And I think these projects have been waiting all over the country for capacity to try and deliver and try and bring back really good rural development projects, good mm. renewable energy projects, tourism projects, and they're not going to be able to do that under okay. this new structure. Talk to me a little bit about agriculture, because agriculture is the backbone of rural Ireland in many ways, and many farmers are very worried about you guys and your approach to, uh, to um, uh, global warming. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's interesting because one thing that the, that the Green Party has been very strong on is ensuring that we maintain farm families in this country. Michael has quite rightly pointed out the disproportionate income gap that lies between farmers in the West and farmers in the East. And, and something that we are absolutely uh, and have been absolutely strong is, is promoting Ireland as a clean, green food island. Now, there is a problem and there is a challenge there yeah. with Harvest 2020 and trying to meet climate, climate targets. We, but the Greens believe that, that we can meet the climate targets and still produce sufficient food. Farmers don't believe you, no? Well, I, I, I think small farmers are, are being let down by, 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 by this mantra of Harvest 2020 and they're not, get, they're not taking it and not believing it. But there is an opportunity there to diversify our food production with small, food, small artisan food produ producers and I think okay. that opportunity is not being met. Uh, can I just come in on something? It's not alone, say, government, the way the cap has been done. But we have less tycoons in the meat industry take over. The farmer uh, isn't guaranteed a price at the gate. And it's so you know, volatile at the moment that be it milk or be it suckler or be it sheep, it's so volatile that it's very hard to you know, encourage youngsters to come into okay. it. But the one thing we have got to make sure, and we'll go back to this, for farmers, a lot of rules and regulations are coming in. And in any part of rural Ireland now, if we go to put in a sewage treatment plant, yeah. if we try and improve our towns, there is objections coming in from so-called environmentalists. But, the, but there's a reason for that. No, but no, there isn't a reason for this. If we are going to put in the best treatment plant possible, hmm. nothing is 100% guaranteed. Let's go for it. Let's not always be objecting to things. Okay, sorry, do you want to get there's in, David? There's right there. I mean, it's repeatedly said that the, the cap was a bad deal. I think farmers agree, cap was a very good deal. And it brought, it brought an increased income. It brought an increased income to the to the sixty thousand lowest income based farmers. So I think that's a positive. Mm. Eamon and others mentioned mentioned broadband. Again, the recovery is funding a, a real broadband plan with real money. Other governments in the past have announced plans with no money. Mm. Okay. This is a plan gone to tender, money behind it. And when, 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 broadband when, when, broadband when will they get the broadband? When will they get the broadband? 2021? But, no, 2018 will cover about 85% eight, eight, of the country, mm. 2020 for the rest. But again, okay. it's, there was plans before with no money. This okay. is got money behind it. Let Eamon in there. The, the, the technology has changed very rapidly in mm. the last five years. And I have been saying that the only solution is fibre broadband. Mm. And what fibre means, one gigabit. Not the 30 meg we're being offered by the government. The other thing is, what the government should do is roll this from the outside in and let the commercial companies roll it out from the inside out and let them meet in the middle. Mm. If you keep rolling it from the inside out, the more peripheral areas that will never be done commercially will have to wait okay. to last as usual. Now, I have lived in rural Connemara for the last 40 years. Mm. 
And one of the biggest challenges, we have created absolutely viable industries, very, very successful industries. But one of the biggest challenges all the time is basic infrastructure. Mm. And what we need, it can be hung along the, telegraph, the telephone poles now, is fibre broadband. Okay. Okay, you know, I've got to, I want to bring in, in our audience because they've been very patient. And uh, I want to go first to Joanne Neary. Hi, Joanne. Um, you've heard a bit about uh, people talking about recovery, people talking about whether it's been felt in, in rural Ireland. What's your experience? Well, I would actually say that it's gotten worse because I see, especially over the last, say, even two or three years, more and more men have had to leave North Leitrim. And, I mean, their hearts are broken. They're missing their children growing up. And as a result, then, the women are doing the farming, raising the children. They're expected to do the doctor visits, the school runs. Yeah. Absolutely everything, plus raise the kids. I mean, it's very stressful for everybody involved, yeah. you know, the fathers are trying to get in touch using Skype, but again, the infrastructure isn't in place even for that. Yeah, but and Joanne, I mean, a lot of people say you, you live in North Leeds, you say, a very beautiful part of the country, and, you know, there are advantages to that, but maybe the, the quid pro quo is that you don't get the jobs near you that, that you might get in other areas of the country. Well, to be honest, we're having to be very, very creative. You know, um, I'm trying to forge my own way and start up a small business. No, there are no jobs. There are no jobs. And, you know, whilst I appreciate the promises being made, they sound very insincere because okay. we've heard it all before. Okay, I want to go to Adele Sweeney, who's behind you. Adele, we're hearing some areas are being left behind. Other areas are doing okay, and I think you're, you're in one of those. Um, yeah, I'm running a hotel in Ballina in County Mayo and um, the Ballina Manor and we're, on the, we're fortunate enough to be on the Wild Atlantic Way. Uh, Ballina is a hub town and we've seen a huge benefit from the Wild Atlantic Way in Ballina. Um, it's bringing the international visitors in it as opposed to just domestic. Um, the rise, I think it came to about 12% overall, and I have to say I definitely agree with that, if not more. Um, being close to Dan Patrick Head, and overall, we've had a huge positive. Okay. Yeah. okay, okay, well that's good news. Neil Walton, I think two, two rows down from you. Um, things are going so well for you, you're, you're expanding your workforce, I believe. Uh, yeah, no, we, we found the Wild Atlantic Way very positive, and we're looking at an expansion uh, next year. Our business grew around 20% in 2015, and we're quite positive uh, for this year. And I do believe the Wild Atlantic Way hasn't hit its potential yet at the moment. I think it's only 20 or 30 percent of its potential because it's so new. So we're looking forward to the future and, and working with Fall Charland. Okay, uh, Eamon O'Keefe, there's some positivity there, which is more perhaps than you're prepared to give credit to the government for? No, uh, I've always been in favour of the Wild Atlantic Way since it was first men mentioned to me when I was a minister. And I've always been supportive of it. It has been very, very successful. On the other hand, Right near me, there's a timber mill employing 200 people, 300 if you take indirect employment. They can't get broadband. Mm. They can't operate. It is literally the biggest single site timber okay. mill in the country. Yes. Can't get basic services. Okay. On the other hand, people often think it's impossible to create jobs in rural Ireland. Within 14 miles of my house, there are 500 industrial jobs created by local know-how, and also created by indigenous resources. So the possibilities are there if we okay. create enough, yeah, but we need the basic infrastructure. Now, having worked in industry, okay. Okay. I can... Okay, we'll put that point. That put that point. Basic I infrastructure. Think, I think in fairness, I mean, Eamon, you were 10 years in government and you didn't bring broadband to the area, which it could have, it would have helped prevent some of these the jobs. The technology wasn't there place. to do okay. The technology was always there, but to be key here, the Wild Atlantic Way is a prime example of, of, of using a, a local asset, developing on the strengths of an area, and that's what the Regional Action Plan for Jobs is about. It's actually focusing in Okay. on the strengths of an area. But it's actually about using, bringing the national stakeholders involved with local communities in the community, creating local jobs. And it works very, very well. But it's, again, you mentioned Leitrim. I was there in the, in the, in the Manor Hub, Manor Hamilton. There's a company there called Miranda, uh, exporting to 85% of the okay. products all over the world. But they've developed a hub there, an enterprise hub for more companies to work okay. in. They've got broadband. So they, it shows that companies can be based there and can create jobs. Okay, we when they get the broadband. Mal Malcolm, Malcolm, very, very briefly before yeah, I bring some more. that the Wild Atlantic Way has had huge benefits to those communities. There are a lot of communities that may not benefit from that. But there are projects there that could be a benefit. And I'm talking about rural uh, community-owned renewable energy projects. Yeah. And, and, and regeneration of our towns and villages is vitally important. And there's some very good heritage aspects to that. I think the Living Cities initiative needs to be extended to every okay. regional town in the country. Okay, very David, quickly, Michael. There's one thing, David. Um, 
The likes of Knock Airport should mm. be made into a central hub for the west of Ireland. The previous government, in fairness to them, had um, Ireland was involved in the TNT funding. Mm. That's where you bring Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland together. And the west of Ireland has been completely taken out of that at the moment. We need urgently to get back into that to put the rail links, the road links for okay. the people in the west of Ireland. Okay, I want to go back. I want to go back to the uh, to the audience. Des Morrison, where are you? Yes, um, Hi, Des. How are you doing? I'm a member of Sligo ICMSA and I'm yeah, speaking from just, a farming background. Okay, but I just want to put the point to you about you know, people saying that the state is withdrawing from rural Ireland. Is that true, do you think? I would go even a step further, David, and say the state has withdrawn, withdrawn from certain parts of rural Ireland. Look at it. Look at it. Withdrawn. Policing services gone. Mm -hmm. Postal services gone. Some education services gone. Our banking services gone. It took century and even before the uh, state was formed, okay. to put them services there. Now they're go. decimated in okay. the space of 10 years. And other problems coming from rural <laughs> Ireland is, we were exporting cattle live, uh, a tradition, before okay. even the state was formed in this part of the country, to okay. Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Okay. Now we cannot do it. Okay. And the I other big issue in farming okay. is milk price okay. I is on bring the floor. Yeah, we, we probably won't get into milk prices, but I want to bring in uh, Betty Holmes. Betty, you're from Donegal, and, and um, you, you've had problems with cancer. Yeah, uh, first of all, thanks very much to Primetime for inviting us down here because Donegal doesn't always get included and we welcome the opportunity. Um, Donegal Action for Cancer Care, totally voluntary, unpaid group going 10 years, 10 months. We were the people who actually took 15,000 people in 10 days to secure a permanent breast surgeon for Letterkenny Hospital. There was 95 breast cancer diagnosis at Letterkenny Hospital last year. There's a waiting list of approximately 600 patients waiting to be seen. We have worked tirelessly with the SALTA group, with the Cancer Control Programme, the mm -hmm. HSE. We had meetings at the Department of Health in desperation last February when we wrote to the Minister because, again, the centralisation of the referral process for breast cancer appointments at Letterkenny Hospital. What that means is Letterkenny Hospital was making its own appointments for approximately 10 years for its own cancer patients breast cancer patients, suddenly the SALTA group decide that this is best done in Galway, where they were done on a daily basis, five days a week at Letterkenny. We now have the staff at Letterkenny Breast Unit sending the request for these appointments to Galway, where twice a week the lead consultants allocates the appointments. It is not acceptable. Cancer services have been taken out of Letterkenny okay. Hospital. We had, sorry, I'm, I know you're under pressure time-wise, but if we look at the prostate neurology, we had the consultant resigned at the start of uh, okay. 2015 because he had no funds. Okay. Yeah, but we sorry, have I, I need to bring in somebody else from Sligo. Yeah, yeah, we have approximately 600 <clears throat> prostate cancer patients waiting on okay. their follow-up appointments. The whole thing, the system is breaking down, and the reality is that the Salter University Hospital Group and the Cancer Control okay. Programme have no interest in Letterkenny Hospital. Hospital. And we saw earlier, this is the reality, okay. 308 kilometres from Mallon to Galway. Okay, thank you, I'm Betty. I'm sorry, we're passionate about it, I and thank I, you. I quite understand. Thank you very much. Um, Maureen Durkin uh, in the front row there. You're from Sligo. Yes, uh, David, and apologies that the voice has deserted me due to okay. a cold. Uh, so I hope you can bear with it with me. Um, I'm from Sligo Cancer Support Centre, but part of a much bigger network of community cancer support centres throughout the country. Mm -hmm. Now, since 1990, uh, we have been beavering away, working hand in hand with the oncology units in all our areas, uh, providing emotional and psychological support for cancer patients and their families. And that's now recognised as being just as important as the clinical mm -hmm. interventions uh, that they receive in the hospitals. The one huge issue for us is that um, for the last umpteen years, despite all of this work, we have gone totally unrecognised, unsupported, not funded and okay. totally undervalued by the Department of Health. Okay, Margaret, so here I, I tonight, have to put, try and put that to that, but thank you very okay. much. <coughs> Damon English, you can't stand over that. Surely. No, I mean, the, the idea of reason cancer centres was, to, was to, for the quality of treatment, and that's important, but it shouldn't affect 
uh, any particular area in terms of delay of get access to that service. I mean, there's great results coming from those centres, but you know, having a waitlist, what you described, is not, is not good enough and not acceptable, and that's something that has to, has to be addressed. In, in relation to your own area, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, in all our counties, and even County Mead, the travelling, the, the distance to get the service, to get the supports, the supports is just, uh, it's just as important and a major part of your recovery as well. So, uh, hopefully, I think as, as naturally as, as finances in, in, improve, there will be the, the, the availability of resources to be able to fund your work because it's, it's an essential part of recovery. I understand that. Okay. And I would agree on that as well. There's other issues uh, mentioned there as well about, about farming and so on. And yeah, I think well, well, let's stick with the health. I want to put it to Eamon O'Keefe. Eamon O'Keefe, it was a Fianna Fáil led government that removed cancer services from Sligo. The diagnostic and operations, you're correct. Hmm. Now, the advice we got at the time that that was the optimum uh, in terms of getting the best outputs. Was, it, was it the wrong advice? Um, I'm, I'm not a cancer specialist, so I have to go, go by what the specialists say. One of the interesting things, of course, is the failure of this government to fully implement Witching Fein and the DUP in the North, the Good Friday Agreement. Because the obvious thing to do in the North West is to have a joint arrangement between the authorities in the North and in the South. Mm. And that hasn't happened because you then get the critical mass to justify putting in top quality services. And my experience of this government is that they've disengaged from the process that the Good Friday Agreement was meant to take, bring in, which would make a huge difference mm. to the Northwest and the border counties by making sure that there were shared services along what is a totally unnatural border okay. within this country. I'll just run along very quickly, Michael, very quickly. Obviously, you can't have uh, centres of excellence in every county. Obviously, there are medical advantages yeah, to have centres of one excellence. The one thing I think you should uh, make sure you do, you try and make them as accessible as possible okay. in a central area. In fairness, I was in Killebegs the other night, and you can go up further in Donegal. Yeah, it's sure. a heck of a track. You have the motorway, you have the railway, okay. you have nothing to get from Donegal down to Galway. Okay. And I think something needs to be addressed. One line for you, Malcolm. Yeah, Sorry, we've, got we're, the main, we're under we've got the main pressure. political parties playing auction politics now while all of these services are going unfunded. Okay. Hospice care, there's a disparity now. Your geographic location now determines your outcome in, in relation to cancer. Similar with neurological service and neurorehabilitation service. We have a fantastic service in Kilkenny too, Koshnor, okay. and they're doing fantastic okay. work in the community and they need that support. Okay, sorry to cut you across, but, uh, cut across you, but we do need to uh, go and take a very quick commercial break. We'll be back with more discussion. Join us after this. Welcome back to Tubber Curry Community Library, where we're discussing rural issues on prime time. I want to go first to our audience, Henry Fingleton. Uh, hi, Henry. Um, I know wind power is your issue, uh, turbines and so on. A lot of people in, in urban Ireland might be looking at you and thinking, any time there's a bit of investment in rural Ireland, you're complaining about it. Uh, well, it's not the kind of investment that is good for rural Ireland. You have hundreds of communities literally being thrown under the bus in the name of green energy. The 1,400 turbines we have deliver very small savings, 2 to 3% of our overall CO2. And meanwhile, there's a proposal that's been ignored by government that could convert money pint to biomass grown in Ireland over in time, mm. would create 5,000 jobs and would save 3 billion in the grid. Now, there's a lot of talk about fiscal space, yeah. 3 billion on the grid. And I'll ask the politicians to go down to the Department of Energy and ask them to show you the justification for spending 3 billion on the grid with no cost benefit okay. analysis. Well, let's, let's put that to Malcolm Newman of the Green Party. I know wind energy is a big issue for you guys. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that there is, there is a major challenge there. And I think more dialogue needs to take place between communities who are on the receiving end of these, of these type of projects and um, the wind energy projects themselves. I, I think the issue around the biomass uh, needs to be challenged in the sense that currently the, the, the vast majority, 80% of the biomass produced in this country is going towards medite and it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's being used for, for other purposes. There, there is a challenge there for a lot of the biomass industry itself in trying to um, uh, address challenges around chlorine content and I think that's a technical issue. But th there's no doubt that we do need to significantly ramp up our uh, renewable energy output to meet our 2020 targets or we're going to face significant fines. Okay. So I think, there's a, I think that's a challenge for the next government to try and address those issues and the address issues okay. that we're Is that something there. the next government should be addressing? First of all, um, I believe that the wind turbines are non-viable. I think they're a white elephant. I made that very clear. Uh, economically, I'm talking about. Because mm. all that's actually benefiting out of this is the investor. Second of all, I would disagree with you, Henry, on the biomass. At the moment, there are timber 
uh, manufacturing factories, as Eamon talked about one already. Bringing timber in from Scotland, we don't have enough of biomass in this country. We are actually importing palm kernels at okay. the moment from South Africa. So let's be realistic okay. and let's be honest with people. We do not have enough biomass in this country to run uh, okay. some of our plants. I want to bring in rural crime as well. John Dolan. Where's John? Yeah, I, Hiya, John. I mean, um, we just saw earlier in the programme the crime in the capital, which, you know, is a lot more serious, some would say, than what's happening in rural Ireland. Yeah, we've um, three agricultural businesses, and we've been the victim of crime on three separate occasions the last 12 months. And I think it's coming to academic levels. And I was just wondering what is going to be done about rural crime. OK. All right, Damien. I think the, in, in, in response to the, this increase of rural crime, we had Operation Tor was set up in October. I think the results are very, very fruitful. There's seen a reduction of 30% in burglaries. There was an attempt at that. There's been a major increase in guard resources put behind that, with over 500 arrests. So I think there's a, there, so there is some improvement there, but it's to keep that focus on that, to tackle that, because it was a major issue. But I think, like, like what's happening in Dublin this weekend, there's a response from, from our Gardaí, led by the Commissioner, backed up by extra resources from, from, from taxpayers to do that. And I think right. these planned operations with a real focus of resources, and again, we're rebuilding the Gardaí, well, we're rebuilding the Gardaí numbers. I mean, others closed the, the Gardaí College. We've reopened it. Okay. Extra thousand guards in the system and more to come, because you need a, a greater Gardaí presence with new investment in vehicles. Okay. Okay. That's what you need. I want, get, I want to get somebody else in the audience in. Ronnie Owens from Cows. Where are you? Yes. Hi, yes. Ronnie. What's yes. your experience? Yes, here. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have high speed and broadband crime to beat the band and lots of trickle-down crime from the gangland world that the minister doesn't seem embarrassed to admit. These gangs are there for years and every, every half-witted parent knows that, that the, only, the, the, way, the way you deal with aberrant teenagers is to put in control systems and sanctions. Mm. And they're there in ample... In, in, today's technology gives all kinds of, of like ta sanctions like tagging, okay. li li like withdrawal of driving okay, license, seizure sure. of vehicles, yeah. uh, passport suspensions. These gangs in Dublin are busy okay. able to perpetrate crime from Spain. The, their passports okay. should have been seized long ago. Oh, okay, Ronnie, thanks. Eamon O'Quave, um, a lot of the, you spoke about guard stations earlier on. A lot of the guard stations that were closed might have had one member in them. They might have only been open part-time. Did it really make that much of a difference? What made the difference was, now there's two types of crime and I think we should differentiate. There's what we call the motorway crime, mm. where you get gangs coming out of cities uh, perpetrating crime in rural areas. And then you have a lower level of crime that mainly is generated within the areas themselves. Now, where the local guard that living in the community was very, very effective okay. is in the intelligence they were able to gather on that type of crime. Okay. I accept with the motorway crime, it is talking about high technology, mm. CCTV, okay. high park guard the car. I don't know any rural community, and I live in one okay. day to day, that wouldn't okay, I'm going want to a local guard okay. living with I'm going to give community. each of you one final sentence and a mean sentence. Malcolm. Yeah, just in relation to the rural crime, I'd absolutely agree. I think that the net saving to the Exchequer has been something like 500,000 a year, and I think the light on in the Garda station what? is the important thing for rural communities. Garda youth diversion programmes have been cut okay. by up to 50%. One sentence. And that's a really okay. serious yeah, challenge. None of these people come from the cities. Uh, out to the countryside without having information. We have lost the local Garda, which was crucial in all of rural Ireland. Okay. There are 13 or 1400 Garda behind desks that we can, ordinary people can do that job and get them out on the beat. The local Garda okay. must come back for rural Ireland. Damien. It's about increased Garda presence. That's why we reopened the Garda College. There's an extra 1,100 guards. We're committed in our okay. recovery plans to another 600 a year on top okay. of that. But that's what we need, more guards okay. on the beat. OK, well, look, thank you all for joining us. Thank you to everybody in our audience. Thank you very much to the good people uh, here in Tubbercurry Community Library for being so hospitable. We really must leave it there. But from Miriam, myself, and everyone on the team here and in Dublin, thanks for watching and good night.